welcome to season two, episode four of Mixtape with Scott. We have a great guest today on the show who I'm excited to introduce to you. But before I do, we have to go through our weekly liturgy about the role of stories in our lives. I don't make the rules. I'm obligated. This is handed down to me by the president of the United States each week to read this line from Sue Johnson's excellent book, Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. Uh, as it, as Dr. as Professor, as President Biden believes that this will help us better understand what this podcast is about. We use stories to make sense of our lives. We use stories as models to guide us in the future. We shape stories and then stories shape us. Mixtape with Scott is a podcast devoted to listening to the personal stories of economists, scientists, and authors. As you listen to their stories, as, it, as you pay attention and you're present and you're curious, my hope is that you hear the echoes, weirdly enough, of your own story. Sometimes it's in the very, very, very specific stories of other people that we somehow hear the more general stories of all people. So my hope is that you will feel a sense of connection to the guests today, as well as come away with a story that helps you make sense of your own life, maybe even have a model to help you navigate that life as well. So with that said, let me warmly introduce uh, Dr. Claire Brown. Dr. Claire Brown is a labor economist at UC Berkeley. She's had a fascinating career uh, from her early work on gender discrimination in labor markets to her focus on integrating economics and engineering at UC Berkeley to more recent work on Buddhism and economics and even more. Uh, she is uh, also an author on a book about Buddhism and economics that I would highly encourage that you check out. It was great having a chance to meet her and learn more about her, and I hope that you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. I'm the host, Scott Cunningham, and this is The Mixtape with Scott, season two. Well, we are now kicking off season two of The Mixtape with Scott, episode one. Uh, and it is an interview with a um, person that I have never spoken to before, uh, but I've been looking forward to this interview for uh, probably a month at least, uh, Dr. Claire Brown. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, it's great to join you. Thanks for asking me. Uh, for the sake of the, the listener, can you tell me your, you've already, I said your name, but can you tell me your name, your title, and uh, who you're sort of pays your paycheck and where you live. <laughs> okay, so I'm Claire Brown and I'm an economics professor at UC Berkeley. And I live in Richmond, California. Actually, it's called Point Richmond, California. And just to let you know, I live not that far from a Chevron refinery. Mm. And that actually influences me quite a bit. Oh, wow. Wow, wait, so is there, are you, you're not near Berkeley? How long does it take you to get to Berkeley? To get to oh, campus, fifteen minutes. Oh, there's, okay. There's a there's a Richmond stop and there's a Berkeley stop on Bart, so it's oh. easy to take Bart, and Bart's like twelve minutes. Oh, okay, okay. So, are you close to? Are you? Where's the water relative to where you live? Uh, it's it's out my window. Oh, you can see the water right now. Yeah, I'm by the bay, and oh. you know, it's like okay. Um, that's one of the charms of living here. It's also a very diverse community, which I like. So it's yeah. got plenty of professors, but it's got plenty of artists and all kinds of people. Mm. How, many and, years, how many years have you lived there? Well, I moved here in about 1990. Oh, okay. Okay. 1990. Okay, well, we'll get into that. Okay. So, so where did you grow up? Before we start getting into your career, tell me where you grew up. Okay, well, this is also a big part of my story because I grew up in Tampa, Florida, when it was it was practicing apartheid. We had white people that ran the city and had all the wealth um, and were in charge. And then mm -hmm. we had Cubans who were the tobacco workers, because at that point, that was Tampa's major industry, mm -hmm. was making Cuban cigars. Mm -hmm. And then we also, of course, had African-Americans that we called Negroes who were black mm. and all three of those groups were segregated. Yeah. And they had different schools. If you went to the grocery store with your nanny who was black, um, 
you would have two water fountains at the grocery store. One would say Negro and one would say white. Mm. And it was that way everywhere. The movie theaters, everywhere you go, the schools were completely segregated. It mm. was really, I realized early on because my, the, the woman who took care of me, Nazarene, she really made it clear to me in a very loving, kind way how her life was real different from mine because she wasn't white. Mm. And um, I learned so much from her that it really enabled me to understand discrimination at a very early age. Hey, that's why I became an economist, I think, and I studied discrimination. Um, be, I blow it all to Nazarene, and I'm so grateful to her for caring for me in mm. a way that really helped me understand her life, my life, and why it was so different. Mm. And how old were you? When? What kind of conversations did she have with you as a child that were sal that were sort of salient? Oh, okay. so I would walk down to meet her at the bus stop, which is a half a block from my house. And she'd hop off and I'd say, Nazarene, why are you always in the back of the bus? Why don't you sit up front? It'd be easier to get off. And she'd say, oh, I'm not allowed up front. Only white people can sit up front and, and Negroes have to sit in the back. I said, oh my gosh. And a little kid, even I thought that's ridiculous. Yeah. And then I would go to see a movie like, you know, Alice in Wonderland. And I'd say, oh, Nazarene, I saw the best movie. You've got to go see it. It's Alice in Wonderland. And she'd say, oh, Claire, I'd like to see that movie, but I can't because the the Negro Theater doesn't show any movies like that. Only mm -hmm. the white ones. They don't let us in. So sometime, I mean, it's just it's in a very nice, very straightforward way. This is how it is. This is life. Um, And so as a little girl, I could say, that's that's awful. That's terrible. You should be able to go to the movies. We should be able to ride together on the bus. We should be able to do all these things together. And it was not hard, even when you're eight years old, to understand yeah. discrimination and how, how unfair it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you felt that feeling of unfairness, even as a little bitty kid? Oh, I felt it really deeply. Mm. Yeah. As I grew up and saw it more and more, because it hadn't changed even when I was 16. Uh -huh. The system was still in full force. I, to be honest, Scott, I couldn't wait to get out of Tampa. <laughs> so yeah. I couldn't wait to leave the South um, mm. because of that. It was just yeah. too difficult. Right, right. So w when you when you were in high school, w what were your interests? What were you, what were you, what did you like to do? And what was your sort of school, what was your school experience like? Well, I was at the public white high school. And um, to be honest, it was a terrible education, which I really understood when I went off to college at Wellesley. And mm -hmm. that's when actually the, the women's colleges and the men's colleges were still segregated <laughs> by, by gender. Mm -hmm. um, but it was like, well, the problem was school was too easy, so I could do it real quickly. I was Val Victorian, but you sort of had to hide that. Although I didn't, I just, uh, oh, well, I like school. I do my work. Um, I took the hardest classes I could, but none of them were hard. And right. I never wrote a paper, but mm -hmm. but it made, and I loved math and math. So when I went off to college, I was a math major because math was simple. It was easy. It was fun. Yeah. Um, and my my first English, I couldn't do English, I realized, because I'd never done English. Um, we'd mm -hmm. never written or critiqued books. So my first paper in the English class, the professor called me and says, we have a problem. We got to figure out how to get you writing well enough that I can give you a C. <laughs> <laughs> was that freshman year? That was at Wellesley? Freshman year. Yeah. And so I was in shock because, of course, I didn't know. Because you were a valedictorian. <laughs> <laughs> you also see in high school i knew you had to like be popular or you know get along yeah. i had a great group of what we call girlfriends and we're still friends today but oh, that's great but i was so i was a cheerleader um you know i did i did the social things that you're right. But to be honest, i never felt comfortable <laughs> i love doing schoolwork and i love yeah. doing math and I wished we'd had more schoolwork to do. Right. 
So what you get to Wesley like what like sixty four? Yes, actually that's true. I was class of sixty four high school and then class of sixty eight at Wellesley. Okay, so you get well, there. Why are different from Hillary <laughs> Clinton? You were y'all there at the same time? Wait. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Were, did y'all know each other? Well, she crossed everybody's path, but we weren't in the same dorm. Yeah. Uh, and she's she, a 1968 Wellesley graduate also? No, no. We, she was one year apart. One year apart. Okay. 67? Uh, yeah. No, I think she was 69. She came after me, one year after mm. me. Um, but she was, she was woman around campus. She knew everybody. She was mm. all, already political. She ran for office and won, um, you know, college offices. But I, I, me, no, no, no. I'm busy doing proofs, math proofs. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so you get there. It's like so you're there during a pretty tumultuous political time in American history, and you already have this kind of, uh, I don't know, um, this value system that's like uh, that that that's that's really sensitive to injustice. So, what was it like for you? You know. Uh, being, you know, so serious about your, about your schoolwork, but that also the, the, these like, you know, civil rights kind of events are happening around you. Right. Yeah. You know, I was so lucky, Scott, to be there with, with two revolutions going on from a social viewpoint. One was race and the other was feminist. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we had the anti-war uh, protesting. So there was lots of protesting and I learned a huge amount that really helped my learning about society, how it works um, and all the different ways that power sort of uh, rules people's lives. Right. And it made me, and it's one of the things is I did because of all of this, I actually grow sort of bored with math because- you did. You know, there are hardly any math majors. There were like four mm. of us. Mm. And the, and I go out in my dorm into the common area and my friends would be having these great discussions. Then they were all econ majors. Mm. <laughs> and econ was like the largest major at Wellesley. And I'm thinking, mm. you know, I better go take economics. This sounds really interesting. Mm. And so I started taking economics, um, but that went until my junior year. And because I had to get rid of all my requirements and so forth. Um, and which I had a lot, no, nothing like AP from where I came from. Yeah. So I fell in love with economics. It was like, oh, wow, this is so interesting. So I took as much econ as I could and yeah. I graduated. Um, and I decided I wanted to be an economist. Who, who are some, are there some, some economists that, that taught you at Wellesley that you sort of remember? really fondly that 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 some of us should would be good to know their names yeah the person who was really a great mentor to all all the students was carolyn shaw bell mm. and she really encouraged women to go on in economics um and she really sort of understood what people's different skills and talents were and yeah. work with them and so I got to know her quite well, and she she stayed in touch with me after I left. Mm. What did she teach? What was her area? Oh my gosh! What Carolyn Shaw Bell knew everything. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't remember what class she taught. I, whoops, sorry. <laughs> when did you When did you get your first taste of labor economics? Was it at Wellesley? No. No. I went to graduate school, so I was married. Okay. Okay. Uh, we moved down to D.C. Um, where my husband lived, and he was an attorney. Um, he graduated from Harvard. I got out of Wellesley. We moved to D. We were married. Moved to D.C. And I had a job for one year as a research assistant. And I looked around. And I said, "Oh, well, what's the next step? So, how do you progress to be, you know, have more power and work?" Mm. And so, and I looked around. And the only thing you could do is go to graduate school. There did were no. You, did you ever think about law school? I could imagine law school was something that crossed your mind. I did because I came from a family of uh, lawyers. Oh, okay. So, so forth. I did, and I realized early on, Scott, that I hated controversy. It's like 
I didn't yeah. do all the controversy. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have the personality. I'm much better off sitting in the library working. Yeah. 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 So you could see that. You could tell your husband was a lawyer. Your parents have been lawyers. You could sort of feel that that wasn't the right fit, even though, like, I could imagine someone with this sort of interest in social justice and even labor topics going and becoming a lawyer. But you, you could, you felt like it was graduate school in economics. Yeah, because actually in those days, we all wanted to change the world and improve the world. And economics was considered a really critical tool. Mm. Now, later on, I, of course, learned as I was working on inequality for decades, along with my colleagues at Berkeley and MIT especially, mm. we, we knew how to reduce inequality. We knew the policies. We, we knew the research, the policies. We knew what to do. And we were, we were ignored. The politicians yeah. ignored us. And so while we were working in the 70s and 80s on reducing inequality, Mm -hmm. and making the world a more just and fair place inequality was skyrocketing yeah like, so you so this is like so you graduate from wellesley 68 you take a year to become an ra so we're, we're talking this movement into the 70s it's really a big you're watching so yeah i'm just kind of wanting to set in my mind what you're saying the you're watching a lot of major changes to sort of workers and poor people can you tell me a little bit about it yeah, so that was that was actually pretty exciting, but um, it wasn't going fast enough. It was mm. just it was just starting because remember the Civil Rights Act, all of that uh, the the um, the book the number one the, the sort of the grandmother of all books about feminism was written in 1968. Mm -hmm. and so in the Civil Rights Act and the Equal Pay Act, they weren't passed until the early 70s. So we were just seeing this starting. And I thought economics would be a great way to really help push it. So, um, and in the DC area, the best graduate school in economics was the University of Maryland. So I applied there and got in. Um, and there were two women in my class, but boy, was I ever lucky again. Uh, Barbara Bergman was on the faculty mm -hmm. and she was working on discrimination and inequality and it had a big grant. So I got to go work for her and I learned a lot working for her in many ways. And so I'd gone into graduate school work being actually in math econ um, and not, not worried, not thinking about labor, but I ended up and I never took labor because we didn't really have a labor economist. At Maryland, you didn't. No. Even though Dr. Bergman, Dr. Bergman wasn't, wouldn't you wouldn't have considered her a labor economist, even though she's she working. No, she didn't call herself a labor economist. How'd she? How would she have described herself? She would say, "I work on, um, I work on micro topics of how to improve people's lives," and mm. she didn't really. And she would teach. Um, courses on policy, on econometrics, on sort of how to link, uh, how to set up a project to do research that would result in policy. Right, right. And she, so she, she was well connected to with Brookings, as was Charlie. I worked with Charlie Schultz, too, and he was at Brookings. Yeah. And he, of course, was more of the macro person. So but, what do you write your dissertation on? Oh, labor market discrimination. So you wanted to do labor. You you were you were very much interested in that topic. Were you an outlier amongst your classmates working on something in labor without that strong labor, you know, support system? I didn't really think of it as labor because Barbara Bergman didn't or no one else did. We I thought see. about how to do a research project on a major social problem and that um well, you can relate the research to changing how the how, in this case, labor markets work. Mm -hmm. And so my dissertation is why do unemployment rates vary by race and sex? Uh -huh. Why do unemployment rates vary by race and sex? That's oh, what it was. It was an, it was, you, so you document it. Okay. So keep going. I'm sorry. Right. No. So it was a, it was a segmented labor market study. Mm. And at that time, Scott, a lot of people didn't believe 
and segmented labor markets. Right. Right. They had this kind of perfect competition model of labor markets where the, all the wages should be equal. I mean, I guess like you, is that, is that because, uh, Claire, the, the, the micro data isn't widely out yet? Is there something about it that's just like people just don't like, what's the cause of that? Hey, Hey, we, we just, when I, we were just getting computers, right? Oh, you're too young to know that. Yeah. So my dissertation was on key punch cards. You have to key punch the cards to get the data in to write your program and you carry them over every night, these big boxes of cards and give them to the computer operation people to run for you that night. And you really hope they don't mess your cards up. Mm -hmm. um, That's a coding error back then. They, they, they drop your, they drop you the card. anything. If the card doesn't flow in yeah. right, you're right. out of it. It's like yeah. one more day wasted. Well, so what are you doing? Are you like literally like punching? you like, you're, you're coding by like punching stuff or what? No, no, no. Oh, wow. <laughs> I wish I had a photo I could show you. No, it was called a key punch machine. So you uh -huh. put, cards, you put, you put it in a stack of cards and then you type and the machine uh, punches it for you. Okay. 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 So you got this. So you're going to dot. So, so even just documenting the labor market differences by race and gender itself is kind of like noteworthy. That's, that's right. That was a huge task. It's just yeah. collecting the data and then you analyze it and you show how look, there's lack of mobility provided between male jobs and female jobs or white jobs and black jobs. And so you can actually, you document and then you analyze the flow. Mm. Um, them. But once again, we didn't have the data that they had much later on. Mm -hmm. What data set did you use for that dissertation? <laughs> Who knows? Probably, probably some form of data from the Department of Labor. I remember being in touch with the BLS a lot. Mm -hmm. So you do this, you do this topic and, and it's, but you're also trying to explain the differences. So what was sort of your key, what were some of your, your theoretical reasons for why you thought this was not, why this gap was staying as an equilibrium? Well, because what I did was I set up two models. One is a free labor market model yeah. that people have access to jobs just based on merit and so forth. And mm. you, would, you would get one kind of outcome that you could then look and see. And then you'd have a segmented labor market model where you would actually have um, different markets that within themselves act like free or competitive markets, but the line into that market is only women, mm -hmm. or only men, or only black women, or only black men. Right. And you can actually, given that you could get enough data, which I was able to from the Department of Labor, um, set it up and then analyze the flows in and out. And from what you would expect, Hey, in a free market model, you'd, if you have one model, I mean, one market, it just had one market and yeah. you're everybody in line and you say, well, that's really interesting that the women end up over here and the white men over there. And it, I mean, you could see real clearly where in this one market, people are still flowing into these segregated slots. You were watching not just differences in wages, but sorting. Oh, totally sorting. And so you'd say, and that's why, and then actually what I was, this is where I was not so lucky. I was born at the wrong time and that Gary Becker came along and said, well, of course, that's what people want. That's just their preferences. Right. That white women want to be school teachers and secretaries and nurses and librarians, and they don't want to do anything else. That's what they you, like. How'd that make you feel when he said that kind of thing? made me feel like he didn't know enough. Right, right. He had way too much power given his lack of understanding what women or blacks want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It actually made me, of course, it made me angry. So mm -hmm. more and more, but. Um, I mean, what would you say back to him? It's so hard when somebody says that because you're kind of like, you're stuck, right? You don't really know, like, what's the evidence that I would like, what do I got to get survey evidence about how I actually do wish I had a different job? Or what would you say back to him? I'd say, you know, let's look at it. If you look at it as a segmented labor market, yeah. you actually can very easily understand 
what's happening and what the choices are and how people are responding to the choices available to them. And that actually maps out quite well with data. Mm -hmm. That that model works yeah. with data. And actually looking at one big, large labor market, you just end up saying, well, why would people want that crappy job? Is it really, is it really what black women want to do? Clean houses and clean toilets all day or take care of kids and that's all they want to do? Right. Right. But, you know, it's hard to change people when they're at the top of the heap. Sure, sure. So wait, wait, did you, was this your job market paper? Would you like, did you like have an interview at Columbia or something like that where Becker was there? Oh yeah. So I had, it was my job market paper and Berkeley invited me out and they actually loved it. So I knew Berkeley was the place for me, even though um, I left my husband and left <laughs> and went to Berkeley, but I went to he John. Stayed, he stayed in DC. Yeah, he stayed in D.C. and uh, I went to Johns Hopkins. Oh, you and, did? For an interview. And they hated my work. They mm. said, we don't see how you could possibly even set up a model with segmented labor markets. They don't exist. Theoretically? Oh, there yeah. Wasn't, they, there wasn't a model. There wasn't some segmented. I actually don't know this literature very well. I, I usually just sort of can I usually tell it the stories of it, but but I didn't know that there's not a was that there's not a theoretical tradition of these segmented labor markets? Oh, there is, there is, but ideologically, it's amazing. Uh, how, yeah, how, right. We aren't supposed to be ideologues, but trust me, Johns Hopkins. They said we only want free market economists here. Right, right. Like, oh, yeah. Okay, then I'm not the person for you, and I just, yeah. I just left. It's funny, isn't it? Because like, I think to, to a non-economist that would hear that, they would go, well, you know, for, what's free market economics have to do with this segmented labor market, race, race inequality. It's like, it's funny. I mean, like how deep economists have understood that, you know, a lot of things shouldn't exist if that free market you know, or if that, if these things move into a certain kind of equilibrium, a lot of things around us shouldn't even exist at all. But, you know. Well, one of the things you need to understand from a labor viewpoint, if you study the history, is that the institutionalist had the power and the they were in charge um, mm. throughout the 30s and 40s. And it, uh, even before, because there was Thornton Veblen, who yeah. wasn't a socialist and then was treated as a sociologist. But there was Commons um, and his Wisconsin school, and they did great work. And actually, because of their work, we had unemployment insurance and Social Security from the, mm. from the Wisconsin school in the Depression. And so institutions mattered. And yeah. institutions would structure markets. Right. And so I didn't have any trouble with that. I was taught that. I learned that. I knew the literature. I knew the history. But it, the Chicago school really changed that. They yeah. came, they said, no, no institutions can be explained just by market forces. Right. You don't need institutions. They're not structuring markets. Uh, only the free market, there, there's nothing, they actually would go on so far as say, nothing structuring markets, although I think we all know today we're yeah. structuring markets. Right. <laughs> This is structuring and government structuring, but markets are structured. So who was at Berkeley when you do that interview? Who is it that who is it that really struck your eye that caught your eye that you were like, I wanna, I wanna work with these people? Oh, well, I was really lucky there because George Akerloff picked me up at the airport. Oh wow. Well, how what was he? An assistant professor or was he already older than that? He he had tenure by then, but he had not yet had his lemons article published. Oh. Getting the turned down. Yeah. The day I arrived was the day the JPE accepted his lemons paper. Oh, well, I thought he went so to the QJ. Everybody was in a great mood. They were celebrating. They were happy. And George was in a great mood. Yeah. Um, and he, of course, <laughs> really liked my work because he believed in institutions and structuring markets. And yeah. And so I met with him and then um Quite a few people were there that that really liked my work, but not mm. everyone. 
course. Um, sure. But always George Akerlof was important to me and we're still in touch. Mm. Mm. Um, so you get, so you get to, so I have this question. I, now I kind of have like questions about labor. I want to have like a bunch of different questions. So I'm teaching this, like, I'm teaching this history of economic thought class um, and I'm just loving it uh, so much. But um, I was kind of wondering, do you feel like you are, you like identify, like you feel a certain amount of kinship with the labor economists? When I say something like that, does that sort of feel like you're like, those are my people or is like, no, I don't really, I don't think in those word, those ways. Oh, oh yeah. I, the thing is, is that there's no such thing as the labor economist, to be honest. There's still a, quite a wide variation. You're mm -hmm. right that now, fortunately, at the top of the heap are the econometricians like, I mean, David Carr does fantastic work. And I'm so grateful that he came to Berkeley and stayed at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And and I know you think of the sort of the con econometricians or statisticians as the labor economists. And they are certainly the most respected and have the most influence in the field. But there are actually quite a few labor economists that are th spread throughout the nation that work on um, in more institutional ways. Yeah. They might they might study unions. Mm. They might study um, sort of different kinds of policies that regulate certain markets. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily do differences in differences. Right, 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 right. So, but, but you, do you sort of feel like those are your people, or do you think that way? Like I, I, I sort of always kind of wondered, like, who are my people? Because I, I never, I, my research interests have always been a little unusual. But like, um, I really, really admire the labor economists. Um, I love the commitment they have to the workers. Um, when you read these old classical guys, you know, they, uh, not to get on a tangent, but, you know, because they just think in terms of these three groups of people, the landowners, the capitalists, and the workers, it's just like, it's a huge part of the history of economics, this, this big group uh, and their overall well-being. You know, and not all of the classical economists really seem to come down. They, they sometimes have like what appears to be biases, you know, against them. You know, like maybe 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 aren't particularly sympathetic. I have been really surprised, honestly, how many of the classical economists talk about the poor. They they, you know, maybe 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 they maybe this isn't maybe they're just not politically correct. And that's what sort of stuns me a little bit. But the language of immorality around the poor amongst the classical economists is just, it's really common. They drink too much. They're lazy. And I was just kind of curious, like, did you notice as you were working on topics in, you know, poverty and labor, did you ever kind of just notice that there was like morality judgment about these groups of people that like, you know, cause like, I don't, I mean, maybe, maybe that's maybe an IO they're doing that too, but it, it seems like there's just like during this period of time with Reagan and things, there's just really, you know, pretty intense statements made about the, the poor. Right. But I didn't hear economists saying that. I... Sorry. That's okay. I... I definitely heard um, politicians say that, like yeah. Ronald Reagan went on and had the welfare queen. And actually that was in, in my book, American Standards of Living, that was really key in getting the country to believe we didn't need a social safety net. Mm -hmm. yeah, we had a social safety net and that we therefore didn't have to worry about inequality, that people, who make more money deserve more money they work harder they're smarter and we don't have to worry the welfare queen don't you worry she's got all her bonbons i mean he was outrageously racist about it yeah yeah and but he he convinced the country that 
since we were taking care of poor people that they could go out and make all the money they wanted to right and this was actually i think a major turning point where reagan could convince people that they could make all the money they wanted to they deserved it and they could have enjoy their lives and not worry about poor people right 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 but i didn't to be honest i didn't hear economists pushing that but then i was working on inequality and discrimination and poverty so right um, Maybe it's just the people I hung out with because we were really upset by that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we we're trying to figure out how to offset it, but we never could. Right. And so we we failed. We totally failed on working on inequality. We to be honest, I think we weren't political enough. Do you think there was a missed opportunity or or what? You think you could have done something different, or if it was just I think we needed to go team up with a political scientist, but that's in retrospect. Who knows what would have happened? I have no idea. Yeah. I don't know that even today, though, um, with the work that the labor economists who use RCTs and do rigorous analysis, um, even they have a hard time convincing people it's okay. The minimum wage actually has doesn't actually create an employment mm. or that. Don't worry, migration is not taking away all the good white jobs. It's like, right. Right. They, even then, the political, the people of the political side just seem to win the day. It's like, yeah. um, and I, and so actually, I have started working some with some political scientists to try and understand how to take what we know on policy, because I, my research team at Berkeley created something called the Sustainable Shared Prosperity Policy Index. Um, and the political scientists love it. And they say, oh, good, we can use this. And I say, great, can you tell me how you can use it to like actually create or have an impact on policy? Mm -hmm. They say, well, it's not easy, but that's what we do. Um, and so we have a network at Berkeley of people, political economy, but across disciplines, not just economics and political science, but trying to figure out how to how to, you know, take research, put it into policies and then have an impact and not just right. have it sit on the shelf. Right, 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 right. But it's hard. I don't uh, have any uh, answers except that I know with the climate emergency, I looked at my colleagues and I said, look, we might have failed on inequality on having the government do policies that would really help people and now we can't fail i said we're killing the planet mm -hmm. we know what to do we have technology we have science and we aren't going there yeah yeah uh, real quick i have one question the so i found this interesting thing that you were asked or that you asked it says does education and then a good job allow people to achieve a middle class lifestyle and leave labor market problems behind and you said no. And I thought that was interesting because I felt like in my labor, my grad labor class, we read Kevin Murphy and June and Larry Katz and a bunch of others where it was the big story was, you know, this divergence in earnings by skill and the rise and the returns to skill. And I left those classes just kind of feeling like, you know, education really was the key to addressing poverty, but it sounds like you've got a more, you've got a slightly different, or you've kind of got your own take on it. And I was just kind of just curious, can you tell me more about that question and why is it you think somebody might say, you could sort of imagine somebody saying yes and why you would kind of say what you said? Right. Yes. There's actually a very simple answer. And actually, Larry Katz would agree with this. Okay. It's like, um, sure. If you have a, if you have a vibrant market, so there are plenty of good jobs. If, if you don't have any slack and actually you have an overfull side on the macro side, um, where there, the labor market is providing really good jobs, worker has some power then it would be true hey let's educate everybody let's the problem in our economy is you give people a great education you send them out into the labor market and they may not get a good job they might not get a job 
commiserate with their education and skills. And they especially are likely to run into discrimination in a slack labor market. And usually the labor market slack. Mm -hmm. And also, as you know, the labor market power for workers has really gone down. And that's been well documented mm -hmm. by Jim Stiglitz, by um, Atkinson and others. It's like, okay, look, workers don't have the power they used to have. The, the, the divergence between the wages of workers and the wages of executives has enormously um, increased mm. by 10 times. And then we have certain sectors, such as the financial sector, booming and taking over a lot of the economy. And we have the manufacturing sector shrinking. And so you say, oh, well, if I'm low income and I'm black male, what can I do to improve my life? And it's not real clear to them or to economists that if they get the education they need and the experience they need and they toe the line, will they get a good job and be middle class? That's not at all clear. Mm -hmm. some, may, some may not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So some of it, I guess, like the, the focus on education, independent of thinking about these structural issues, can, it just kind of is, it's just incorrect or not, not complete or something like that. Yes, you have to bring into account the state of the labor market, the state of labor power, mm. and also if you're black, white, male, or female. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Well, so, okay. So transitioning a little bit. So in 20, I'm interested in this transition that you make these two transitions, one to, uh, to climate. That's something I want to talk about, but also before we talk about that, I'm interested in this 2017 book that you wrote, uh, Buddhist economics an enlightened approach to the dismal science. It, it makes me think of small is beautiful by, by Schumacher. Um, and I don't want to, you know, diminish it by making comparisons. It's just that it's just so, you know, original that that uh, a a mainstream economist would kind of want to have this re re envisioning of the of the discipline. So I guess I first just wanted to know, like, how did you first become interested in Buddhism before we even get into the book? Oh, so I was a practicing Buddhist actually because a meditation center opened up a 10 minute walk from my house and had the most astonishing um, Rinpoche. And so my husband and I said, well, we just stop by and, and he's of Jewish background and I grew up mm. in a Episcopalian and we stopped by and we really liked it and just started attending and, and had friends and neighbors there. And, um, and then I, by the way, I should never have called my book Buddhist Economics. Everybody thought that meant it was religious, but it wasn't. It was just right. called economics, as you said. Um, and it's actually an economics book because the Buddhists say, well, it is true you have impermanence. So you assume impermanence or that everyone's interrelated with each other and with nature, which is a law of ecology. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's science. And that was an important part of Buddhism and it always has been. And then you assume impermanence that everything's always changing mm -hmm. that, and then you end, you end up, whoops, just a second. What happened to equilibrium? Well, you know, we're always in transition. It, the world is dynamic. Life is dynamic. Right. And a part of inter interdependence is that people care for each other. They can be self-serving, self-caring. They should be, but they also are other caring or altruistic. Mm -hmm. and then, um, you, you sort of bring all those together and you end up with turning the free market model on its head. <laughs> because if people are altruistic and caring, um, and if people care a lot about, you also define happiness very differently instead of caring, it's not hedonic anymore, but it's, it's much more Aristotelian where people um, people's happiness is, of course, interrelated with everyone else's happiness and the state of nature. And they're, and that's because of altruism. Mm. And so they're not trying to just give me, give me, give me, give me. And they actually care a lot about the human spirit, that people aren't 
don't just they care about relationships about community right and that this is all a big part of their lives and so of course they want enough income they want to have basics they want to have right. a comfortable life a good life but a good life isn't just materialism right and it's relationships community human spirit who am i as a person what yeah. matters to me what makes life good right and so the minute you do that you do end up with a very different type of economics where the goal is actually a good life for everyone mm. And so I knew enough to know that this was based upon economics we already knew. Right. So you start off with Amartya Marty Asin, mm. who definitely, and he loved my book and gave me mm. a word. And uh, that's, that's his way of thinking. He, he was a Hindu or is a Hindu. Mm. Um, but he understood interdependence and non-materialism aspects of life and what's important. Yeah. Yeah. An opportunity, of course, cap capabilities. But then there's also um, you. So you start off with Amartya Sen, and then you can add climate science, which we know, or ecology. So we have ecological economics. You add that in, and then you add on top of that what we've learned from the UN that we can re reduce global suffering. Um, mm. That's a very important part of life. And Jeffrey Sachs and his sustainable development growth work. Mm. You, you sort of, they all do great work, but somewhat in their own um, bailiwigs. And so I just said, you know, we know the economics for this. So why don't we just integrate it and start off with these three assumptions and end up wanting to provide a comfortable, caring life for the whole world and take care of the planet. And of course, this was heavily influenced by the climate crisis going on. Hmm. Hmm. Wait, so so is this book a turning point for you? I mean, is it like when you write it and you're thinking of these things, like you're you're changed you've changed in your way of thinking, like about economics? Well, not really. Not really. No, what I it actually came about because I at one point was teaching Econ One, which is eight hundred students and twenty two graduate students um, teaching sections. And I was really unhappy with the way Econ 1 was taught. It was yeah. mostly free market. And then right. on the side, we'd bring in, well, there is this problem with externalities. You but barely get have time to get to it. If you don't hurt, if you, the way the, the, the way the table of contents are structured for Econ principles is you're lucky to get to any of the market failure stuff unless you really prioritize it. Because you can get you can get through theory of the first. You may not have time. Yeah, and it's like oh, inequality. Well, that you know, oh, yeah. we can actually, we know a lot about it. I mean, we see it's like it's an afterthought. So I was really upset by that, but most people teaching it are. Um, right. And so, and there are now today some more options, but in those days there really wasn't. So I was out walking my dog in the hills one afternoon, and I looked at him. And I was already a practicing Buddhist. I, was gonna, I said to my dog, I said, how would, how would Buddha have taught econ one? Mm. What would he have done differently? And my dog looked at me and he said, well, think about it. I'm sure you can figure that out. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and back and I went back to Berkeley and I said, I went to the department. I said, I want to teach a seminar in Buddhist economics because I want to think more holistically about the economy and what it would mean, because right. otherwise I never had any time to do anything. You know, Scott, I don't know about you, but if you're teaching something, you find time for it. If yep. you're not teaching it, it rolls down the list. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. Yeah. So I started teaching Buddhist economics and the seminar was really popular. Oh, I bet it was so popular. I loved it. It's like, uh, they thought, and that's why I love Berkeley. It's like, well, wow, that's so interesting. Thank you. Mm hmm. Um, and then actually an agent came to me and she said, would you write a book? Can we make this into a book proposal? And would you, would you write a book? I said, well, I hadn't thought about it, but I'd consider it. Yeah. And it took off, except we should have renamed it, not Buddhist economics. So that's not a good name for it. Why? What's wrong with that name? Because people you. thought it was like, like, uh, Protestant economics or Christian economics or something. They, they thought it was religious 
They did. I won't tell you how many people, media or even book reviewers said, I don't do religion. I said, right. I don't either. I think of Buddhism as a philosophy of life. Right, 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 right. And, so, and the economists got it that that I, that, you know, that I sort of knew and worked with, like Amartya Sen and Jeffrey yeah. Sen. They knew it. They understood. George Akerlof loved it. Um, but outside of that <laughs> group of people, yeah, right. It, it got Buddhism. Hmm. I don't even understand what that is. Hmm. But it is the appropriate word, even though it's the marketing of it. It's the right. You do feel like that's the right word. It's just the marketing of it is it, people get the wrong impression. Am I wrong? Yeah, I think you're no, I think you're spot on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so one last thing before we go. Um, oh, can the, I just say one other thing? Oh, yeah. It's really mm -hmm. important to me. Yeah. Because I also worked on semiconductors with engineers. Mm -hmm. And this actually was also an important part of my life. It was in the 90s. And because this is where my work and your work overlap. This is where your econometric work and teachings and my work on field work and understanding sort of how the economy is truly operating on the ground. Yeah. So what happened was we were out doing field work paid by the Sloan in, in the Sloan Foundation studying semiconductors and fabrication plants. And the United States was way behind Japan. And we the goal was to actually figure out how to improve fabrication. But that was around the world, not just for US. And we did that. That was great. I loved working with the um, engineering dean. And I led the economists. He led the engineers. And I learned a lot about doing field work and watching things on the ground. But what I also learned was later on, I was working with Julia Lane and some other co-authors, and they came to me and they said, look, we're going to do this administrative study of a bunch of industries, including semiconductors, but we want you and your team to help interpretation of the data. So they came and they found in the semiconductor industry, by the way, it was changing dramatically, where TSMC in Taiwan was taking over fabrication. Mm -hmm. And I mean, doing great fabrication work, better than any of the uh, big tech companies in the U.S., like Intel and Motorola. And so they went in and they had great administrative data and they looked at what was happening within the semiconductor industry, which firms were expanding, which firms were failing and dying out. And they did it by location. So they, they had fabrication plant. But meanwhile, the U.S. industry was changing. They were closing down fabs and they were opening up design centers only. So in the U.S., we were great chip designers. We would design chips and send them to T TSMC for fabrication. But if you look at the data, what it shows is, in fact, the market's working really, really well. That the companies that are highly productive are expanding and they don't have to employ as many workers and the companies that are much less productive and have lower wages, they are declining and even shutting down and going out of business. And so it was <laughs> the interpretation was, look how competitive and great the semiconductor industry is, the market works. And I said, well, the problem is that that interpretation doesn't include the reality of the industry is restructuring dramatically and sending, we're creating design centers with very talented, high paid, highly productive designers, no fabrication. Mm. And we're closing down fabrication plants and sending them to TSMC. So it is true that we're using globalization to lower cost and to really take advantage of the US great design capabilities. Mm. But it is too bad we're closing down fabrication and because we, we need to keep some fabrication in the US. Actually, yeah. because designers need it. They actually learn a lot from, from the fabrication process. Mm. But anyway, that to me is, is, and Julia Lane was great at this. We really agreed and we wrote a book together huh. about how if you really want to do a great analysis with administrative data, which is really wonderful to have, then you actually do need to know to combine it with some field work on the ground to really understand 
how is this industry working? How do you interpret? We need to know how to interpret the data because as you know, Scott, there are lots of ways to interpret any statistical results. Right. And you want to do it in a way that actually overlaps with reality. Yeah, 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 right. And you started some kind of major or something, didn't you? It was like, I was looking, it it was like a, it was something you did at Berkeley that was, that's connected to this. That's right. It's called development engineering. I learn, I work a lot with engineers. I like them. They're smart, savvy, and fun. Huh. Um, if you have the right ones, of course, <laughs> just like economists. But, yeah, yeah, sure. But, um, you know, we, we realized that the engineers were in the lab creating these great solutions, technical solutions for a stovetop or for this, whatever the problem. They had a solution in the lab. Then they take it out to the field in a developing country and implement it. And yeah. then they go back to pick up the data and nothing was working right. It's like, what? like for example, in a stovetop, when they came to pick up the sensors in the stovetop that had all the data they needed, yeah. um, the sensors were all burned. Mm. And they looked into why and they said, the women said, well, the stovetop didn't work quite right. So we had to reconfigure it and flip it over. And, you know, of course the sensors got destroyed. Mm. And so... And the economists would come in late. They'd come in at the end and say to the engineers, oh, give us your data and we'll do a great uh, study and I'll get my PhD and right. we'll put it into an RCT. But they'd come back and say, just a second, you didn't collect the data right. It's like, this isn't how you collect the data to do a rigorous analysis, sorry. So, so Alice Agogino and I said, look, let's just bring it together and have them work together. And it's like a minor for PhD students. So early on, the economists get involved with data collection, both qualitative and quantitative, from the bottom up, user up, and they actually learned it's actually you can do great data analysis early on that's that builds you into a really good treatment and control trial. Mm. Um, And the engineers learn very quickly the value of economists. Oh my gosh, they do know a lot about data collection and analysis. Mm. They can really help us understand from day one how to improve our technology out in the field because we started making the engineers go out in the field earlier and take and take some economists or at least give the economists the data early on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow that's cool well so you you move into so you're doing that but then you you also have moved into this climate this economics of climate and sustainability, right? Well, Scott, yeah, isn't everybody? I mean, I have a couple of little grandsons. It's like, we're killing the planet, we're overheating it. Life as we know it won't be around for them if we don't quickly bring down emissions. Mm -hmm. We've got to stop using fossil fuel energy and transition to a livable modern economy. And we're not doing that. Not mm-hmm. in the U.S. and not globally. Mm-hmm. And top twenty-seven is in progress right now, and um, and the IPCC has made it very clear. And the we got to bring down greenhouse gas emissions by forty-five percent by twenty thirty, <clears throat> and we aren't even bringing them down yet. It's like we're slowing down, but we aren't going negative in terms of change. There's. So we have a, and and the longer we wait, the less likely it is that we can reach any goal that we care about. The economists, their cover story was forget 1.5 degrees. That's not possible. Let's just try and keep it not, let's get as far below 2% increase in global warming as we can, but 1.5 is gone. And Mm -hmm. we should acknowledge that and see what we can do because we've got to move a lot faster. Mm Mm-hmm. And Mm -hmm. so when I saw that, you know, I said, I've got to just focus. And that happened when I was actually doing Buddhist economics. Um, Mm. So that, that was quite a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. And and I just think every single person that teaches or does research or is in the university system has to think about climate and how to integrate it into the work they're doing as an example um, they don't have to do climate research, but they have to think about how can they integrate climate into their thinking, their teaching, their way of viewing life. Because right now is our existential crisis. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to end with this. When, when you think about your life that you've lived as, uh, as a labor economist, as a Buddhist, you know, uh, as a sort of a, almost a theorist and, um, and also this, this environmental economist, all these kind of the, the work that you've done since your earliest times of being interested, I wanted to ask you this, why does the work that we do as economists matter? And then secondly, what does that even mean to matter? What has mattered the most to you in your life uh, as an economist? Well, mainly, I think that we're economists because we love economics. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's sort of the way we think about, you know, how does the world operate and from a resource viewpoint. And I think the economists that I admire, all of us agree, we got to think about how can we help the world do better. And yeah. so that's important. I think the problem is why what we do doesn't matter enough, then as we've already discussed, it's like, why does politics trump economics? And it does, it seems like we know a lot, we, we try really hard, we're well intentioned, we want to help the world. And right now I want to help people and the planet and stop, re, uh, stop using fossil fuels. And so one of the things that I've started doing, and I've been doing this now for quite a while, is, is I work with climate groups, climate justice groups, to lobby for specific policies and um, specific actions in California, focusing on California because we're a climate leader. But one of the things I've learned is that once again, and I really understand now why politics triumphs because big oil, we, we have a big oil industry in California and they just all the time use their money to fight against us and to fight against any climate policies or, or regulations. And we have fights going on all the time and they have a lot of money and we only have people and sort of intelligence. But also Scott, while we, while what we do matter is we care about honesty and transparency. We care about using data correctly. We care about being as honest as we can about our data and our findings. And, and that's who we are as economics mm -hmm. professors. Yeah. And so it bothers me that I'll get out and I'll be at a hearing with Chevron or Exxon and they'll just lie. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll just say anything they want to and no one, and they aren't held accountable. Whereas we are very, very careful yeah. trying to stay with the science and the evidence. And that's also one of the reasons that what we do should matter more. Mm -hmm. and, I, and if you can tell me how to make it matter more, I'd love it. <laughs> well, it has been really a pleasure, uh, Claire, to, to get to spend this hour just learning about you and, and uh, your thoughts on economics, but also just getting to know you better. Um, I, I really appreciate you giving me this time to, to talk and listen. Oh, Scott, let me just tell you how much I appreciate all you're doing to help economists learn and to also help economists figure out how maybe we can do better and help people in the planet. So thank you for all you're doing and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you.